A New England Nun by Mary E. Wilkins Freeman. It was late in the afternoon, and the light was waning. There was a difference in the look of the tree shadows out in the yard. Somewhere in the distant scows were lowing, and a little bell was tinkling. Now and then a farm wagon tilted by, and the dust flew. Some blue-shirted laborers, with shovels over their shoulders, plodded past. Little swarms of flies were dancing up and down before the people's faces in the soft air. There seemed to be a gentle stir rising over everything, for the mere sake of subsidence, a very premonition of rest and hush and night. This soft diurnal commotion was over Louisa Ellis also. She had been peacefully sewing at her sitting-room window all the afternoon. Now she quilted her needle carefully into her work, which she folded precisely, and laid in a basket with her thimble and thread and scissors. Louise Ellis could not remember that ever in her life she had mislaid one of these little feminine appurtenances, which had become, from long use and constant association, a very part of her personality. Louisa tied a green apron round her waist and got out a flat straw hat with a green ribbon. Then she went into the garden with a little blue crockery bowl to pick some currants for Herdy. After the currants were picked she sat on the back doorstep and stemmed them, collecting the stems carefully in her apron and afterwards throwing them into the hen co-op. She looked sharply at the grass beside the step to see if any had fallen there. Louisa was slow and still in her movements. It took her a long time to prepare Herdy, but when ready it was set forth with as much grace as if she had been a veritable guest to her own self. The little square table stood exactly in the center of the kitchen and was covered with a starched linen cloth whose border pattern of flowers glistened. Louisa had a damask napkin on Herdy tray where were ranged a cut glass tumbler full of teaspoons, a silver cream pitcher, a china sugar bowl, and one pink china cup and saucer. Louisa used china every day, something which none of her neighbors did. They whispered about it among themselves. Their daily tables were laid with common crockery, their sets of best china stayed in the parlor closet and Louisa Ellis was no richer or better bred than they. Still she would use the china. She had for her supper a glass dish full of sugared currants, a plate of little cakes, and one of light white biscuits. Also a leaf for two of lettuce, which she cut up daintily. Louisa was very fond of lettuce, which she raised to perfection in her little garden. She ate quite heartily, though in a delicate, pecking way. It seemed almost surprising that any considerable bulk of the food should vanish. After tea she filled a plate with nicely baked thin corn cakes and carried them out into the backyard. Cesar, she called. Cesar, Cesar. There was a little rush and the clank of a chain, and a large yellow and white dog appeared at the door of his tiny hut which was half hidden among the all grasses and flowers. Louisa potted him and gave him the corn cakes. Then she returned to the house and washed the tea things, polishing the china carefully. The twilight had deepened. The chorus of the frogs floated in at the open window, wonderfully loud and shrill. And once in a while a long, sharp drone from a treat ode pierced it. Louisa took off her green gingham apron, disclosing a shorter one of pink and white print. She lighted her lamp and sat down again with her sewing. In about half an hour, Joe Daggett came. She heard his heavy step on the walk and rose and took off her pink and white apron. Under that was still another white linen with a little cambric edging on the bottom. That was Louisa's company apron. She never wore it without her calico sewing apron over it unless she had a guest. She had barely folded the pink and white one with methodical haste 
and laid it in a table drawer when the door opened and Joe Daggett entered. He seemed to fill up the whole room, a little yellow canary that had been asleep in his green cage at the south window woke up and fluttered wildly, beating his little yellow wings against the wires. He always did so when Joe Daggett came into the room. Good evening, said Louisa. She extended her hand with a kind of solemn cordiality. Good evening, Louisa, returned the man in a loud voice. She placed a chair for him, and they sat facing each other with the table between them. He sat bolt upright, towing out his heavy feet squarely, glancing with a good-humored uneasiness around the room. She sat gently erect, folding her slender hands in her white linen lap. Been a pleasant day, remarked Daggett. Real pleasant, Louisa assented softly. Have you been haying, she asked, after a little while. Yes, I've been haying all day down in the ten-acre lot. Pretty hot work. It must be. Yes, it's pretty hot work in the sun. Is your mother well today? Yes, mother's pretty well. I suppose Lily Dyer's with her now. Daggett colored. Yes, she's with her, he answered slowly. He was not very young, but there was a boyish look about his large face. Louisa was not quite as old as he. Her face was fairer and smoother, but she gave people the impression of being older. I suppose she's a good deal of help to your mother, she said further. I guess she is. I don't know how mother'd get along without her, said Daggett, with a sort of embarrassed warmth. She looks like a real capable girl. She's pretty looking too, remarked Louisa. Yes, she is pretty fair looking. Presently Daggett began fingering the books on the table. There was a square red autograph album and a young lady's gift book which had belonged to Louisa's mother. He took them up one after the other and opened them, then laid them down again, the album on the gift book. Louisa kept taking them with mild uneasiness. Finally she rose and changed the position of the books, putting the album underneath. That was the way they had been arranged in the first place. Daggett gave an awkward little laugh. Now what difference did it make which book was on top, said he. Louisa looked at him with a deprecating smile. I always keep them that way, murmured she. You to beat everything, said Daggett, trying to laugh again. His large face was flushed. He remained about an hour longer, then rose to take leave. Going out, he stumbled over a rug and trying to recover himself, hit Louisa's work basket on the table and knocked it on the floor. He looked at Louisa, then at the rolling spools. He ducked himself awkwardly toward them, but she stopped him. Never mind, said she. I'll pick them up after you're gone. She spoke with a mild stiffness. Either she was a little disturbed or his nervousness affected her, and made her seem constrained in her effort to reassure him. When Joe Daggett was outside, he drew in the sweet evening air with a sigh, and felt much as an innocent and perfectly well-intentioned bear might after his exit from a china shop. Louisa, on her part, felt much as the kind-hearted, long-suffering owner of the china shop might have done after the exit of the bear. She tied on the pink, then the green apron, picked up all the scattered treasures, and replaced them in her work basket, and straightened the rug. Then she set the lamp on the floor, and began sharply examining the carpet. She even rubbed her fingers over it and looked at them. He's tracked in a good deal of dust, she murmured. I thought he must have. Louisa got a dustpan and brush and swept Joe Daggett's track carefully. If he could have known it, it would have increased his perplexity and uneasiness, although it would not have disturbed his loyalty in the least. He came twice a week to see Louisa Ellis, and every time, sitting there in her delicately sweet room, he felt as if surrounded by a hedge of lace. 
he was afraid to stir lest he should put a clumsy foot or hand through the fairy web, and he had always the consciousness that Louisa was watching fearfully lest he should still the lace, and Louisa commanded perforce his perfect respect and patience and loyalty. They were to be married in a month, after a singular courtship, which had lasted for a matter of fifteen years. For fourteen out of the fifteen years the two had not once seen each other, and they had seldom exchanged letters. Joe had been all those years in Australia, where he had gone to make his fortune, and where he had stayed until he made it. He would have stayed fifty years if it had taken so long and come home feeble and tottering, or never come home at all, to marry Louisa. But the fortune had been made in the fourteen years, and he had come home now to marry the woman who had been patiently and unquestioningly waiting for him all that time. Shortly after they were engaged he had announced to Louisa his determination to strike out into new fields and secure a competency before they should be married. She had listened and assented with the sweet serenity which never failed her, not even when her lover set forth on that long and uncertain journey. Joe, buoyed up as he was by his sturdy determination, broke down a little at the last, but Louisa kissed him with a mild blush and said goodbye. It won't be for long, poor Joe had said huskily, but it was for fourteen years. In that length of time much had happened. Louisa's mother and brother had died, and she was all alone in the world. But greatest happening of all a subtle happening, which both were too simple to understand Louisa's feet, had turned into a path, smooth maybe under a calm, serene sky, but so straight and in swerving that it could only meet a check at her grave, and so narrow that there was no room for any one at her side. Louisa's first emotion when Joe Daggett came home he had not apprised her of his coming was consternation, although she would not admit it to herself, and he never dreamed of it. Fifteen years ago she had been in love with him, at least she considered herself to be just at that time, gently acquiescing with and falling into the natural drift of girlhood. She had seen marriage ahead as a reasonable feature and a probable desirability of life. She had listened with calm docility to her mother's views upon the subject. Her mother was remarkable for her cool sense and sweet, even temperament. She talked wisely to her daughter when Joe Daggett presented himself, and Louisa accepted him with no hesitation. He was the first lover she had ever had. She had been faithful to him all these years. She had never dreamed of the possibility of marrying anyone else. Her life, especially for the last seven years, had been full of a pleasant peace. She had never felt discontented nor impatient over her lover's absence, still she had always looked forward to his return and their marriage as the inevitable conclusion of things. However, she had fallen into a way of placing it so far in the future that it was almost equal to placing it over the boundaries of another life. When Joe came she had been expecting him and expecting to be married for fourteen years but she was as much surprised and taken aback as if she had never thought of it. Joe's consternation came later. He eyed Louisa with an instant confirmation of his old admiration. She had changed but little. She still kept her pretty manner and soft grace, and was, he considered, every whit as attractive as ever. As for himself, his stent was done. He had turned his face away from fortune-seeking, and the old winds of romance whistled as loud and sweet as ever through his ears. All the song which he had been wont to hear in them was Louisa. He had for a long time a loyal belief that he heard it still, but finally it seemed to him that although the winds sang always that one song, it had another name. 
but for Louise uh, the wind had never more than murmured, now it had gone down, and everything was still. She listened for a little while, with half wistful attention, then she turned quietly away, and went to work on her wedding clothes. Joe had made some extensive and quite magnificent alterations in his house. It was the old homestead. The newly married couple would live there, for Joe could not desert his mother, who refused to leave her old home. So Louisa must leave hers, every morning, rising and going about among her neat maidenly possessions. She felt as one looking her last upon the faces of dear friends. It was true that in a measure she could take them with her, but robbed of their old environments, they would appear in such new guises that they would almost cease to be themselves. Then there were some peculiar features of her happy solitary life which she would probably be obliged to relinquish altogether. Sterner tasks than these graceful but half-needless ones would probably devolve upon her. There would be a large house to care for. There would be company to entertain. There would be Joe's rigorous and feeble old mother to wait upon. And it would be contrary to all thrifty village traditions for her to keep more than one servant. Louisa had a little still and she used to occupy herself pleasantly in summer weather, with distilling the sweet and aromatic essences from roses and peppermint and spearmint. By and by her still must be laid away. Her store of essences was already considerable, and there would be no time for her to distill for the mere pleasure of it. Then Joe's mother would think it foolishness. She had already hinted her opinion in the matter. Louisa dearly loved to sew a linen seam, not always for use, but for the simple, mild pleasure which she took in it. She would have been loath to confess how more than once she had ripped a seam for the mere delight of sewing it together again, sitting at her window during long sweet afternoons, drying her needle gently through the dainty fabric. She was peace itself, but there was small chance of such foolish comfort in the future. Joe's mother, domineering, shrewd old matron, that she was even in her old age, and very likely even Joe himself, with his honest masculine rudeness, would laugh and frown down all these pretty but senseless old maiden ways. Louisa had almost the enthusiasm of an artist over the mere order and cleanliness of her solitary home. She had throbs of genuine triumph at the sight of the window panes, which she had polished until they shone like jewels. She gloated gently over her orderly bureau drawers, with their exquisitely folded contents redolent with lavender and sweet clover and very purity. Could she be sure of the endurance of even this? She had visions so startling that she half repudiated them as indelicate, of coarse masculine belongings strewn about in endless litter, of dust and disorder arising necessarily from a coarse masculine presence in the midst of all this delicate harmony. Among her forebodings of disturbance, not the least was with regard to Cesar. Cesar was a veritable hermit of a dog. For the greater part of his life he had dwelt in his secluded hut, shut out from the society of his kind and all innocent canine joys. Never had Cesar since his early youth watched at a woodchuck's hole. Never had he known the delights of a stray bone at a neighbor's kitchen door and it was all on account of a sin committed when hardly out of his puppyhood. No one knew the possible depth of remorse of which this mild-visaged, altogether innocent-looking old dog might be capable. But whether or not he had encountered remorse, he had encountered a full measure of righteous retribution. Old Cesar seldom lifted up his voice in a growl or a bark. He was fat and sleepy. There were yellow rings, which looked like spectacles around his dim old eyes, 
but there was a neighbor who bore on his hand the imprint of several of Cesar's sharp white youthful teeth, and for that he had lived at the end of a chain, all alone in a little hut, for fourteen years. The neighbor, who was choleric and smarting with the pain of his wound, had demanded either Cesar's death or complete ostracism. So Louise's brother, to whom the dog had belonged, 